Good afternoon, Lisa, and thank you very much for having me. This is a, a rare treat for me and my first Lisa, so, so thank you all very much for introducing me to this part of the world. So in proper DNS fashion, we don't do a who am I slide, we do a dig slide, and eventually, <clears throat> and eventually when the, the dot baker GTLD goes into land rush mode, I will not be spending the money to purchase that because that's crazy. And nobody really uses the new GTLDs anyway. So, um, what are we going to talk about today? Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to contextualize the setting. In proper Shakespearean fashion, we're going to establish where this is happening. So from people who are familiar with working with networks, there are a lot of nuances about your network that can shape how traffic ingresses and egresses it. So first, we're going to lay down that foundation. Then from there, we're going to walk into a little bit of the history of DDoS as we've seen it over the past few years, or at least since I've been seeing it and working in this specific industry. Um, and then after that, an interwoven, kind of like a rope, will be some details about the DNS and how these types of activities kind of expose interesting failure modes of the DNS itself uh, at scale. <laughs> so the first thing to note here is that Dyn's network is an Anycast network. Now what does that mean? Unicast. One thing is announcing that IP address in one place. All those requests will go there. Anycast is more like the world of Spartacus. I am Spartacus. No, I am Spartacus. Somebody in the back right. Okay, now whoever is closest to you who said that is the person who is Spartacus, and that's where your queries are going to go. Fundamentals of any cast. Now, this will become important later on in the story, so don't forget it. So, <laughs> to, to contextualize into the map, if you're in the Midwest and, and you make a request, based on your peering preferences and the, and the transit providers involved, you might go to Chicago, you might go to Washington, and it just adds some ambiguity into the direction or the place which your query will land. The other thing to note is specifically here is that our network is transit-based. So the interesting nuances of peering aren't involved in this part of the equation. So other people's decisions about who to pass traffic to and the hot potato game of take this traffic, I don't want it anymore because it's expensive to carry, are kind of controlled from this scenario. In this case, because it is transit-based, uh, using tier one providers, it's, it's easier to understand how traffic is going to get to and from you. Again, these things will all be very important later. We're building a, a Sopranos-like uh, arc to this story. So in picture terms, if we pull one of our sites at random and we look at how traffic from different providers might get there, we have the cloud, which is always used to represent the internet, and all the different providers which traffic may pass through to get to our providers. And this kind of network graph of who's your friend on the internet or who you're paying to bring and take packets to and from you is a way to understand how all that denial of service traffic is going to be introduced to your network. Now, based on your mitigation strategies and some drift, this, again, is also going to be very important later on. I don't know about you, but DDoS used to be much simpler. It was kind of like a nice homely feeling. Um, but economics have kind of made that strange. And the, the, the point here isn't to say that botnets are new. We all know botnets are as old as the internet is. Um, smoke jumpers, tsunami, pro and IC, uh, IRC bots are very common. But compromised endpoints have many ways of uh, deriving value from them, especially if you can establish persistence on that device. So if you think about launching uh, denial of service attacks, they're very loud to the end user, they're very loud to the ISP. Why wouldn't you resell that compromised endpoint as a RDP as a service, as SOX as a service, or if you really want to burn the persistence to the ground, deploy ransomware to the, to the instance. Get the money and leave. Um, so this, this, uh, this kind of impact sh is uh, shaped by the type of persistence one has, and later on we'll talk about that and how IoT has impacted that. So a few years ago when I was poking around in our dynamic DNS system, which many of you may know, know and be familiar with, we started to come across these wonderful Perl bots. Now, this may not look like the most glamorous DDoS bot that you've ever seen. However, it has some nuances of sophistication. It has a collection of hard-coded command and controlled addresses, as well as a, a, domain, a time-driven domain generation-based algorithm. Yeah, sure, in this case, it's just that dollar $i, which is being incremented over time, so they can increase that integer and move it around in the event the other things are taken. But it shows that back in 2014, people were thinking about this. And I remember the first time I sunk my first uh, 
DDoS botnet, this one, and I saw that it had two and a half thousand endpoints connected to it, I thought I'd done something really monumental there. I thought, two and a half thousand computers? That's a whole lot of computers to be compromised by one thing. Little do kids know. But at the time, it turns out that economics wasn't really leaning in the direction where this was a good idea. There was a different economy where if people wanted to launch DDoSs, you could do it much cheaper and much more efficiently. And commonly this is referred to are the booters and stressors. So you have a, a, a not very sophisticated um, attacker, and what they're doing is they're just trying to exploit the open fundamental nature of the internet to generate large volumes of traffic. Now how do they do this and how much does this cost? Well, as we all know now, you can scan around hack forms and you can find wonderful details about all these providers, including some details and decision matrix that are used by the people themselves. So, recommended servers, onshore, funny enough, are more expensive than offshore. Now, originally this was very confusing to me. I would have thought that the offshore resource, being in a protected haven from law enforcement, would have been more expensive. However, it turns out things which are onshore and can direct traffic in the US and in the EU are more likely to be cracked down upon, therefore they charge a price premium. Good thing to know. Uh, the other interesting note here is that the CADA spoofing project really does work. And it really works in the sense that a lot of booters and stressor operators, when they're shopping for these things, will go check that report to verify that that provider does allow spoofing. So, if anybody in here controls large amounts of address space or a hosting provider, people are using that as a decision metric when they're shopping for servers that they're going to use to do bad things. So, don't allow spoofing on your network. Uh, that's even proven by actually showing, they'll show screenshots from the Cater project on the sites. Now, the other problem there is once you have a, a well-connected server, which allows spoofing and has a big pipe out, you need a way to generate the traffic which is going to do the damage to other people. Now, it turns out, that requires some computer programming skill. Luckily, in this world, we can outsource all these things and purchase them from nice web front ends. The first thing you need to, to sort out is how are you going to generate the traffic? Well, modules for this are all well and available, so then the next challenge becomes, how do I find amplification sources? Now there's another make versus buy scenario that enters. Do I write a piece of software that's going to scan the internet to continuously update a list of NTP AMP, DNS AMP, SSDP AMP servers? Or do I go with an as a service offering where I purchase an updated list on a fixed interval and remove that part of the work as well? Please select your package from the wall. And uh, I guess the, the, the reason for including this is just to show the, the commoditization of the market and the, the, the gradient of skill required for deploying one of these services. Um, because these things aren't technically illegal, um, it, it probably changes the scenario in which they're sold and changes the number of people who might be willing to purchase them or do them. So the other thing we have to think about as operational defenders of networks is the interface that's being used to throw this malicious traffic at our networks. So when you think about the, the type of control panel you have to mitigate attacks, is it this simple? I mean, you might have a collection of NetFlow, you might have a, uh, a connection of, of other things that are giving you details about the traffic that's, in, that's ingressing your network, but is it ever this simple? Put in a host, put in a port, pick the type of uh, attack that you want to run, and go. So now as we think about the number, of type, the number of attacks and types of attacks that we're seeing, we can start to think about the sophistication of the attacker and the simplicity with, at which they can change the vector that they're attacking us. So then the question becomes, how, how does this actually hit our edge? Well, we have the well-connected box, which is red, being the evil people, and they have their list of amplification servers, so they know where to send the queries to in the amplifying ASNs, and then the traffic from there will, in, will then come to our networks, which is distributed based on uh, the peering and transit of the amplifying sources. And this is how that becomes distributed. Now luckily, because of Anycast, it is somewhat distributed based on where these different uh, amplifying sources are and how they're connected to our network. So again, like most things do, the industry started, started to try to help to correct for this. So the providers that we, that we purchase transit from then allow you to set ingress ACLs. So I'm only expecting traffic from this, I'm only expecting traffic for these servers to be received on these ports. So that allows you to cast aside all the spurious traffic from ranges that you wouldn't expect. Now a lot of people in the room might be looking around thinking, how is that not a thing that's always been available? Well, it turns out that memory on the routers used by those providers 
is pretty expensive. And over time, maintaining such a large table can be a problem. So, you know, with the grade of technology, this is something that's more recently become available to more people based on who you're purchasing transit from. It's really funny to think about this very specifically in the, the Amazon Web Services days where you can just kind of like log on and configure what traffic you're going to allow into your ports. And you'd assume that this would be this, this uh, type of interface and this level of ACL would be ubiquitous across all types of network interfaces. Kind of not really, but on its way to becoming there. So this helps solve one set of problems that we see on the network. But at that point, the packet is yours. You've received some traffic on a port that you said is okay to go to that service. And at some point, you're going to have to do some work on that packet to identify if it's in protocol and something that you want to work with. And this is where the challenge enters the network. <laughs> is, is that reflected packet that you want? Uh, is this a reflected packet or a packet that you actually want to process for your service? And how do you distribute those packets across the internals of your edge? So to look at a funnel, we have all inbound internet traffic. We have the traffic that's to the approved ports. And then we have the legitimate traffic. And it's this filtering that has become the fun part of everyone's jobs. So you can go and you can look at how people have done this at Arbor Networks or um, at a number of other different providers. But in the end, the amount of work you're doing on that packet is somewhat significant at that point, And uh, filtering it off your services is pretty important. But when we start to talk about filtering, there are, another, there are a collection of edge conditions which come into play, which I don't want to say prevent extremely efficient filtering, but they add some interesting variables to consider. One of those, uh, my personal favorite, being fundamentally broken devices. So the more, you, the, more, the more you're exposed to, to the raw danger that is the internet, the more you see how things are deployed in non-RFC conforming ways. Uh, so there's certain countries that have large numbers of devices deployed that when you, when you send back a request to query over TCP, they start a SIN flood flight with your server. And the question is, how long will it take for their machine to crash from state table exhaustion before it stops querying you and somebody asks for that same thing again? This happens every day, constantly on the internet in many places. So we have to remember at the edge that when you ask, when you do a, a TCP slip and you say, hey, requery over TCP, you're going to actually introduce some other variables to the scenario, which in an RFC conforming world wouldn't exist. Another fun one are the DNS edge cases. So if you run an authoritative platform and somebody goes to the root and they say, Dyn is going to handle my DNS, but then they never come to your platform and create that record, all the queries that come to a recursive resolver are going to be told, Dyn has an answer for you. But we don't know what the answer is. So all we can do is hand back an R code 5 refused, um, which is kind of a problem because it's a non-cacheable response. Uh, was a non-cashable response and is a should, not a must. Um, so there's, there's a number of areas where this starts to then increase areas where you can have increased conflation of queries based on miscon fundamental misconfigurations in the DNS. And last but not least are the fun things of botnets. Botnets are a joy because they really teach you how the internet has taken a collection of properly formed RFCs and then shaking them around with industry to produce the beautiful beast that we have now that is the completely unregulated and non-evenly distributed thing that facilitates all our communication. And we're going to get into that quite deeply. So let's flash back to an easier time, August 2016. Oh, I remember August very well. So August was, was, was interesting very specifically because we also run a recursive platform. And in the, in the recursive DNS, you start to see lots of signals of things. So one of the signals that we started to see were these new types of authoritative exhaustion attacks. And by that, I specifically mean these 12-character uh, these, uh, long strings appended to domain names that were pseudo-random uh, but missing some things from random. Now, this type of signature stands out at scale very quickly. And it's something that you can start to put together. But and, and at this point, we didn't know really what it was. We just knew that it was a lot of places and it could ask a lot of questions very quickly. Now, that's not to say this is the only entity we saw like this. Um, there's another known quantity uh, referred to in malware circles as Bill Gates, which has a different, uh, with a different DGA that it's appending to things to do authoritative uh, exhaustion. But uh, the, the problem in this case is, essentially by appending that 12-character domain name, 
when the infected client is asking the recursive, it's fairly confident that that value isn't in the cache. So then, guess what happens? It asks the authoritative. No more authoritative, <laughs> no more wonderful distributed cache, and you get that one-to-one -one query ratio. Now, as we started to see this traffic, there's a number of things that come through your mind. So because we'd come from this, this time filled with spoofing, one of the first assumptions you have is, oh, well, it must be spoofed. Well, luckily, years back, when people were trying to put together the DNS and fix some things, um, they introduced this uh, OX 20-bit randomization, which we'll cover in the next slide. Um, but the other things that we saw were that the TTLs were in line and everything about the traffic smelt legitimate, except for this sense that for some reason you, you thought it had to be spoofed. But then there was the OX 20-bit randomization. Now what is this? Now we all know the DNS is a very secure protocol, right? There was no need to append a source port randomization after the original RFC was issued, because that was originally included too. Um, but again, so people come and they, they think of these very clever ways they can improve the system while it's still moving without breaking everything. And one of these things was using the entropy in the characters to increase the, 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 to increase the, uh, the, the, the ability to match the, the query request to the query response. So this hasn't been that heavily implemented on the internet. So when you see recursive volume coming from resolvers, a, only certain sets of resolvers have implemented it. So when you look at the fingerprint and you see the randomization implemented in the resolver and it matches something that you know does that, you can become more confident that the query actually was processed by that resolver as opposed to being spoofed. Um, that and spoofing it would be a bit more expensive uh, for the attacker because if they spoofed the wrong um, resolver, so if they added this randomization to the wrong resolver, that's also noticeable. So their, their binary gets bigger and the, the math that the CPE device, a limited CPU has to do, is just that much greater. So what do we do? We go into the recursive layer and we start trying to figure out what is going on. And this is back in August when, when uh, we, uh, we hadn't really seen any of this yet until we did. Um, now, just for a quick note on the recursive, I know this is, this is Lisa, so people are probably very familiar with this, but it's always good to just give a quick refresher on the number of queries that can be generated as you're trying to resolve a domain. So the end client asks the recursive resolver. The recursive resolver, if there's nothing in cache, asks the root where it can find, where, who it can ask about that thing. It tells it which TLD holds the name server records for that domain. Then that TLD name server ports it to the authoritative server for that domain. And then finally, you get back an answer from that authoritative server. So when, when we look into our recursive resolver and we start to try to figure out what is asking all these questions and how many questions can they ask, we can form these distributions of queries per second produced by endpoint during these attacks. So if you imagine for an attack on another domain, there were individual CPE devices represented by each of these distributions that were issuing queries. And you'll notice these distributions are crazy. So uh, the second column in, when I saw this being, being a more network, network center person, I thought, oh, well, that's, that's the egress of a carrier grade NAT. This is a bunch of clients being aggregated. And because we're outside the network, that's what we're seeing. That's why that volume is so much higher. Well, I went to some other researchers who are more familiar with the CPE devices and the specific infection, and they were like, I don't know about that. I don't know if that's a safe assumption. I think what you're seeing is a, a, a beefier device on a better connected network. Well, we have, we have client IP, so what we can do is we can, we can at least attribute these back to countries and net blocks. And it turned out the far left, the, the smallest distribution, was from Iran, and the better, the better connected distribution was from South Korea. So again, the sample set isn't that large here. So to assert full knowledge and the ability to authoritatively state which is the case, we don't have enough data to do that. But we do have some data to start thinking about how, what, is, what is the difference between the provisioned device and how much CPU that device has and the size of the pipe to the home and how does that impact the number of packets per second or bytes per second these individual devices can get out to the network. So of course, I don't know about you, but when you find infected devices, you gotta go try to figure out what they are. Um, so they have a bunch, they're, they're all listening on web servers, a bunch more on this later, because this turns out to be a big fun part. But, so what's the first thing you do? Well, we again then start to crunch these things together. So these are for the first attack that we saw back in August of the authoritative exhaustion specifically. We took all the queries that we saw for that customer and we broke them out into buckets. 
Now, to step aside and complain about GOIP for a minute, GOIP is the most imperfect science, and, it, and I, as a data analyst, I want to preface that before explaining why this slide is here. Um, I don't mean to assert that these devices are in these countries, but later on, it, it, it taught us some very fun things. Because when this first came out, people were talking about concentrations of these devices being in Vietnam, Brazil, China, and here, if you go and you look at the data set, it shows you they're here in America. What? Like, that's, a, that's an exciting finding uh, at the time. Later on, it becomes very unexciting because that's what happens when, over time, you get more facts. Um, the source code leaks on hack forms. This is the best thing to happen to data analysis because now you can start to marry out these real world resorts, that, the real world results that you've seen to the actual code base which is producing the traffic on the network. Now, this is why we had that distribution before. Um, so the reason 34% of those things show up as being in the US is the default resolvers all have their address space registered in the US. So if you just simply pivot off where that thing is being registered, Google, Hurricane Electric, VeriSign, and Level 3 being the default resolver set. So when Mirai is looking for the resolver to use, if it can't find a defined local resolver, it picks one of these. <sighs> so they made up about, the defaults made up about 24% of the network traffic that we saw. So that's an interesting note on uh, the ability of these devices to find a local resolver to use. Um, and over time, I think that'll become more interesting as we start to study these things in mass. Now, back at that time, the, the longest attacks that we were seeing were between seven and 10 minutes on individual domains. And uh, there was a lot of contention about why we saw seven to 10 minute attacks. Um, and I don't think anybody can authoritatively speak to it. Uh, there was guesses, what, are they testing the functionality? Are they verifying that it all works? Are they trying to see what kind of damage they can do with it? Nobody really knows. There was some questions about how um, the configuration that at the time the, the pseudonym NSMPy had for the CNC, if it could actually issue commands to all the different bots at scale quickly enough to maintain an attack. And this was them trying to figure out how to do the load balancing between the agents. Uh, because there was contention that could they be controlling, you know, 380k devices with, you know, with the single CNC setup that they described on hack forums. Another set of testing that needs to be done, but might have some awkward legal implications. Now, when people see 380,000 uh, endpoints, the question is like, whoa, 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 that's a lot of things to compromise all at once. But it turns out we've seen this before. It's, it's a weaponized Karna botnet that did the internet census. Except the last time somebody did it, they were a nice person and they just made a nice map of the internet and then disappeared into the night. They let us know what they were able to do. And that was kind of it, instead of attacking websites. Um, but just for a scale purpose, at that time they had 420,000 clients with a different set, potentially a different set of vulnerabilities. Um, so just from, from a referential integrity point, it's always good to have, have some anchors for numbers that people are posting in hack forums because it's hack forums. So now we move forward towards October 21st. The fun stuff. Uh, and this is where I'd specifically like to pause and just give a huge thanks to, to our ops teams and everybody else who's in the hardcore thick of these events. Um, as a data analyst, you're, you're kind of off in the side in terms of responsibility and gross levels of stress. So for anybody in here who is directly standing in line of these things as they happen, uh, thank you all very much. What you do is wonderful. And yeah, just, just a moment to say thanks because the data sets that come out of these things are really awesome, but it does take horrible sacrifice to get this data. So what really happened on October 21st? Well, so funny thing. Early on in the morning of October 21st, we saw two short waves of authoritative exhaustion against dollar customer one. Legalist specifically told me that we're going to use dollar customer names and dollar attack names because that's the right thing to do. Um, so these patterns exactly match the things that were in the source code. Um, so we, we are very confident there, Mirai. Um, and then all of a sudden, there's this lull for about an hour. And additional attack traffic starts to come in. Now, as we tease apart network captures, we can watch them trying different attack types on different pieces of our infrastructure. Now, the interesting thing here is, uh, as we mentioned earlier, because it's anycasted, the landing points of this traffic, 
vary heavily based on which of those uh, pieces of infrastructure they're targeting. So if you can imagine, um, if you were to, to, to look up at your, your networking alerting board and just to see these kind of like odd strobes in different places, so if you're doing like a localized summary versus a, a summary of the entire edge, it makes a very strange pattern. And the, the rate at which they're changing between them also has some interesting nuances about the response time for the endpoints themselves. So, layer seven attack traffic. The fun part about working in the DNS is not only do you have the fun of UDP, but you also must respond to TCP queries. Yeah, that's, that's a big part of things. And uh, as that traffic flows in, you're trying to figure out what's going on. Well, as they are hitting different endpoints, things are flashing all around to different places. And funny enough, what do you do when those things happen? You create a study. So of the, of the attackers that were coming in, we went back to their autonomous systems and used some trace routing tools to figure out what sites that traffic's gonna land in based on the endpoint they're hitting to verify that our map of the network map matches out. So for example, one of these specific Hong Kong ISPs, as they went through different infrastructure pieces, was hitting three different data centers based on which attack type that we're launching. Kind of interesting. Um, and this is, this is kind of what takes the, the ability to do the, the network, at, network edge aggregate view very important versus localized views. For anybody right now who's trying to think about how to tier that dashboard in their NOC, um, having these trade-offs and the ability to like, visualize these trade-offs in real time is extremely important to avoid confusion. Well, so then we go and we look at some of the net blocks that we're seeing attack traffic from, and we look at how they're connected to the internet. Because this connectivity path from a data analyst perspective gets super interesting when you start to do risk modeling. Because in the future now, we need to start thinking about as new infected populations pop up, how are other things which they might be targeting impact how traffic is getting to our networks? So these are just a few chosen at random. But as you look, the the connectivity of some of these is, is their connectivity to tier one providers is very similar to ours and the types of providers they're using are also very similar. So the nuance of which path is selected is gonna vary over time. In the, in the other case of the, the, the net block above it, it's a very simple path. So from a bigger consideration standpoint, as we start to think about how you mitigate these large scale IoT uh, attacks, Understanding the, the flow of the traffic through the network and how it's going to get to you and why it's going to land where is going to be increasingly important. So as attack traffic is rolling in, the first thing you want to do as a data analyst is to figure out what are these things. Because to verify, to, to verify a, a specific device that's involved gives you that level of confidence that you know what it is, that much more of a bump. Now for anybody who hasn't checked it out, I highly recommend this tool called Lyft. Um, what it does is it goes out and it makes, uh, it makes, it basically checks the SSL certificate of the device as well as the title page in the device and puts together a strong guess. It's kind of like P a, a non-passive POF in a sense um, to tell you some details about what that endpoint is. Now, because one of the manufacturers of those endpoints has recently put together a potential lawsuit, um, if you mention that their devices were involved in things, their name isn't included here. But if you Google things that get infected by this variant, the, the distribution is very close to what you would expect. But one thing that's important to, to think about in this case is that timing is really important because as time goes on, DHCP leases change and we really wanna verify these fingerprints because if you can verify you know, the top 10 talkers or even the top 20, top 25 per site all fit these specific device profiles, your confidence that you understand what's going on is much higher and you can feel much more comfortable and that's what's really important as a data analyst is to feel comfortable. Because other people are fighting a fire but you want to feel comfortable. So um, this led to this huge exploration of DHCP lease timing things. Now luckily the folks over at Ripe had recently done a study and, they, and uh, put together a great paper which is linked at the bottom about uh, reasons these addresses change and the rates of change. Because one of the things we were seeing specifically in uh, Vietnam, Thailand, and a few other places in APAC, where some of these leases are, are very frequently less than a day. So if you go out and you start fingerprinting devices, the probability that you're gonna get the device that, that, that actually was involved in the attack gets kind of strange, because in some cases, the attacks will also cause the devices to crash. 
and then the device crashes, it might get a new IP and it might come back as another thing, thus making figuring out the number of endpoints involved in an attack a bit more challenging. Wait, there's more. Um, because nobody ever just attacks you with one botnet, they also glue together this other strange thing that you haven't seen before. So before we were talking about uh, random subdomains with the 12 characters glued on, now uh, the identification of non-human generated strings is a pretty well established science. Whether using jacquard shingling or n-gram analysis, it's something that you can go to GitHub right now and you can pull, you can pull down somebody else's work to put together. Um, but if somebody were to say, crawl the internet and put together a corpus of words which are human generated, and then start throwing those in, uh, things get a bit more complicated. So as we start to look at this traffic, the corpus that was produced, the, the corpus of this other thing was about 31 to 35 megabytes of traffic that we, of, of names that we have uncompressed. So most likely it's not IoT related because why are you going to push that corpus around onto all these devices? Uh, and the query distribution was 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 pretty good um, uh, geo wise. So. Other things lurk out there, most likely not IoT based, most likely server based, uh, just due to that corpus size. So these are the feelings. So you wanna, you wanna feel happy because you have this new data set, but then you also feel very awkward because a strange thing is still happening. And this is still just the beginning, or this is still part way through the first wave of attack. And other people are going crazy, and you're sitting there fiending over this delicious data that now exists because <laughs> The, the caching layer just is, is going away on the global DNS, and you're seeing very interesting DNS failure modes. Because uh, unlike what anybody would like to tell you, the DNS was the first eventually consistent database. It really is. And you have all these different clients, the sub resolvers on phones and laptops, asking questions of resolvers, and all the resolver wants to do is ask an authoritative so it can give you back an answer. Now, everything's okay as long as you can get that answer back but that answer has the time to live. And nowadays, time to, the time to live on some records isn't that high. Because we've had this trade off between nimbleness and durability. People want to be extremely nimble because they want to be able to shift traffic around. They want to be able to steer around routing inefficiencies and deliver quicker responses. Um, and it's, it's just a way things have gone as the topography of the internet has changed because there's a lot of different pipes things could go down and you want to be able to make changes to endpoint quickly especially with auto-scaling groups and Amazon. I mean, there's a number of drivers for it. But that TTL is, is, is pretty much going to govern how quickly that happens. Now, a lot of people have said, OK, well, we'll just make really long TTLs. But that just shifts the economics of attack. Because if you have a really long TTL, I know you can't move that property now, and now I'll just attack that thing. Um, so it's, it's an awkward argument. I think, I think either side is just going to push back and it's like, no, short TTL, long TTL. Uh, realistically, it's just a, a nimbleness measure for your business or for you. And it's, it's kind of like a fun little calculus to play in your head. So recursive resolvers and retries. Uh, who's familiar with happy eyeballs? So we were all excited about getting, about getting V6 working. I think everybody in the room is excited about getting V6 working and making it a real thing. I think when iOS put the default race, the default, um, I don't want to say hindrance to the race in, but a, a guaranteed v, uh, quad A and A query for each thing looked up. Two queries for one is normally OK because you have a nice recursive layer to soak all those queries up. But when that recursive layer can't get a response, that's not the best thing for things on the internet. Um, and then you also think about the four name server records. So there's been a lot of questions about how an RFC conforming entity would resolve to this. Um, are you going to get eight queries? Are you going to get a, is the recursive resolver going to ask each name server record in the domain once for each A? Is it going to ask once for each quad A? And it's awesome because nobody really knows until you look at the data set. And it's completely dependent on the type of resolver software you're using. And it turns out that not everybody is running unbound and bind and these perfectly RFC conforming resolvers. A lot of people have written in-house resolvers because they wanted features that weren't available in others. So certain large recursive platforms do 10x, 20x, 30 times the volume. So now you have a collection of legitimate queries, illegitimate queries, and other things 
all asking you for a collection of responses and connections to a finite body of resources. <sighs> we can breathe. Eventually, you resort to some interesting collections of uh, whitelisting and other, uh, and other, uh, other mitigations, and things subside, everything calms down, and Friday goes back to being normal. Wave 2 comes back, bigger and longer. Um, the attack type 4 that they used, targeting a collection, of other, a collection of the infrastructure, which they'd seen to be useful, they issued again. And uh, then, all of a sudden, a second botnet came in, targeting another set of infrastructure. Uh, I note here that later analysis would suggest this is the second Mirai botnet. Um, it, matches the sin, it matches the fingerprints um, of the attack. So it's probable, but yet we don't have proof, so I don't want to authoritatively state that's exactly what happened. And then, a few minutes later from that, back with the DNS and protocol attacks. Quick note to thank the community. As all this is happening, I've never seen so many people that you compete with business for being so wonderful and nice and offering help. Um, threat intel researchers, you know, offering all the details they had about all these things that you could take care of all the problems. Um, but then there's a question of how do you reach out to all these impacted parties? We now have all this data about these infected devices that we've collected and fingerprinted that we can issue some confidence on for that period of time. Um, finding the bodies in the search to give those back to is still somewhat not a solved problem um, at scale, especially in countries where they don't have really good support for those type of functions. So you kind of wonder, do we as a world need something which is funding certs in underdeveloped countries? I think these type of incidents kind of lean towards the fact that maybe we do. And the other question is, what's the best format for this data? What types of metadata are required for this to be actionable to people, especially with the changes in DHCP? That timestamp is pretty much required, but what else do they need to know about it to actually do anything? So as we flip down this timeline events, those, the, the frequency of things related to these IoT threats is just increasing and increasing and increasing. Uh, the last three being of super interest. Um, to a lot of people, uh, specifically the, the IRCOM, DTAG, TalkTalk, Talk, and Post Office CPE issues, because now we're seeing large bodies of devices in first world networks being targeted uh, for these infections, and they're also very concentrated areas. So if you think about what would happen if those 900,000 devices in DTAG were infected, AMSICs and DSICs are very close to there, and those internet exchanges are extremely important to the delivery of traffic throughout Europe. And now you have densely concentrated devices there that could potentially be impacted. Now, luckily, in the end, there are limits to growth. And uh, coming from a background of system dynamics, this is a perfect time to throw system dynamics models up and say, guess what? People made modeling for this way back when. And it's very simple, because this actually models very well like infectious disease does. Because we have susceptible populations, we have the rate at which these scanners can convert and infect them, and then we also have the infected population, which can produce a certain number of packets per second on another portion of the population. The problem is that body of potentially infected devices is only growing. Um, we've seen recently if them people, go, people from going from just scanning for open telnet and default passwords to these uh, CPE management protocols, uh, specifically some of the new SOAP variants. So as all this low-hanging fruit is being picked, there's more advanced actors going out and thinking of new and in, in, ingenious ways of infecting larger populations. Uh, the, one of the more interesting being, yesterday there was an article in Vice about somebody writing a server that was distributing custom firmware and reflashing these devices, which solves the firmware persistence issue that we mentioned previously, which then opens these up to a whole new venue of potential awful use cases. So, in conclusion, this ecosystem is growing and is shown to be profitable and to cause impact to the point that we're talking about it now, and as the attack was going on, people were saying it was Russia and it was China. Uh, <laughs> anytime that can happen from compromised home devices is kind of a crazy thing to think about. Um, but you never want to leave people with a feeling of sense and doubt without giving them some hope. So people have been thinking about this, and there are some potential solutions. One of the stronger ones being the, the routing manifesto manners. Um, so this is a, a set of best practices that are deployed across people's network edges to, to try to help and control some of this traffic. After all this happened, there was a lot of pushing and shouting for, why haven't we implemented BCP38? Um, in this case, that wouldn't have helped. However, it would have removed an entire subset of consideration concerns as we're doing mitigations. So 
Yet again, we, we thought we figured out how to solve this in the past with BCP38, it was just never implemented, and now we have more things that we would like to get implemented, but don't seem to be very high priority for the world. Uh, the other one being assistance for poorly funded world certs. These points of contact are extremely important as we're trying to remediate these infected populations. And last but not least, uh, the FCC has done a great job of reaching out to researchers to try to identify um, suggestions for controls on how we can help better um, control the deployment of these hyper-insecure devices. So there's a lot of people in this room that have really good feedback for that. So please engage with the FCC, try to help shape their recommendations, because the worst thing that can happen is we can all do nothing, and these devices can continue to be awful, and we can have this horrible whitelist-based um, white internet where I can only trust traffic coming off your network because I know you and you've been corporate approved. Um, and it's, just, it's a very dangerous direction for us to go in. Uh, this, the, the walled garden internet versus the free and open internet. And the only way to help promote the free and open internet is to help make, uh, make it safer for everybody. So I think with that, yep, we're on to questions. Hi. So, so why why is your is uh, are your is your service still up? Did the um, did the folks attacking you get tired, or they just stopped, or so? Or? Yeah. It's a great question. So we actually received another round of Mariah attacks uh, yesterday. Uh, <laughs> however, you'll notice it was not in the news. <laughs> so over time, uh, you know, network defenses evolve and you learn more about the opponent and then also upstream, upstream, um, the ability to implement upstream controls also increases. So as we learn more about individual infections, just like disease, it's much easier to present, prevent their impact. Uh, however, they can just as easily pivot as we can. Does that answer your question, or is there? Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>